The following program has been pre-recorded. Late Night America is a presentation of WTVS in Detroit, brought to you by public television stations, by the Stroh Brewery Company, family brewers for over 200 years, and by the makers of Soloflex. Welcome to Late Night America. Later in the program, a visit with one of the funniest men in America, actor James Coco. He's lost more than 100 pounds, this time for good. Right now, we're going to talk about the battle against pornography. The story behind the person known as Linda Lovelace, star of the porno film Deep Throat, is a story of a prostitute who became an international celebrity. Behind the scenes, it's a story of horror, violence, and degradation. Our guest is Linda Marciano. She's married with two children. Good to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. When people uh, think about you uh, and they think about Deep Throat and that experience so far in your past, and they say things like, you might not hear it, but you know, well, she seemed to enjoy it. Uh, Mm. Uh, there was, uh, she wanted to be there. Does that make you really angry? That one makes me especially angry. They always say, they talk about the smile on my face, but nobody ever mentions the bruises on my body uh -huh. or questions them. You right. know, that's frustrating. Before the whole deep throat thing happened for you, mm -hmm. paint the picture of just being a prostitute and what that's all about and what that was like for you. Uh, it was a very uh, uncomfortable situation. I had grown up in a very middle-class America family. My parents were very protective. At the age of 21, I really didn't know what a prostitute was. I ended up learning about these types of uh, activities that our society indulges in through the actual experiences of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was hard. It was really hard. You know? And God became my only friend because anyone else that I spoke to uh, would run to Mr. Trainer and tell them that I wasn't really into it and, 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 and things like that. You were gang raped? Yeah, that was my first situation was uh, I was thrown into a hotel room with five people. Mm. And I was crying and one of the people asked for a refund and a gun was brought out. I had refused to become involved in it and Mr. Trainer said that he would shoot me. And I said, you can't shoot me, there's five people in here. And he said, well, they're not going to care. Because uh, to them, you know, you're just another object, another p a body to be used by them. And uh, if you're shot dead, you'll just end up being another prostitute that had a, a bad time. I'm sure that at times, you know, you talked with other prostitutes. Uh, they also have similar stories of being controlled. Oh, yes, definitely. What happened to me is a typical pimp prostitute situation where you're thrown into a situation with, uh, with sometimes 20 men. Uh, a lot of them are injected with drugs, and uh, after the situation occurs, the uh, pimp will come, come off like, well, your family's not going to want to have anything to do with you anymore. Uh, after what's happened to you, they'll never respect you, and the degradation begins, and the dehumanization. You were beaten? Regularly, on a daily basis. Uh, I think that the hardest part was not so much the physical abuse as the mental abuse. That was even harder. Can you talk about that for a little bit? What, what form would that take? Uh, constant. Uh, your hair is too long, your hair is too short, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too short, you're too tall. Uh, you don't know how to wash your hair, you don't know how to wash your hands. Uh, just that constant, 24 hours a day, you can't do this, you can't do that. Had to ask to go to the bathroom? Oh yes, I had to have permission. And even in the house that I was living with Mr. Trainer, I was not permitted to go by myself. He always came with me because there was a window in the bathroom and if there was a window I could make an escape. Why do you call Mr. Trainer? I only call my best friends, my good friends by their first name. Hmm. What did you mean when you said one time next they'll be selling women's skins by the side of the road? Well, we've gone from the credibility and acceptability, quote unquote, of deep throat to child pornography where the youngest victim is 13 months old to snuff movies where they literally beat a woman to death. They commit murder, and the producers of these films make money on it. And the next thing is they'll be send, you know, selling women's hides on the side of the road. You said uh, one time that you were glad that you weren't around when they were making these snuff movies. I'm glad I escaped from Mr. Trainer before that happened, because uh, I probably would have become a victim of that. There seems to be some understanding in the, in the 80s. I guess there's been some change that when people uh, hear about wife abuse, 
uh, there's a little bit more understanding, a little bit more sympathy. When people uh, hear about rape, there's a little bit more understanding, a little bit more sympathy. People just don't have the understanding and the sympathy about the prostitutes, do they? A little bit more understanding with rape. I mean, when a woman is raped, it's always the woman's fault in mm -hmm. our society. Well, what was she doing? It's like uh, when I was on the book tour, I was in Seattle, Washington, and they had a curfew. There was a lot of rapes occurring, women, a lot of women being raped. So they put a curfew on the women. Now, that made me angry. Why the curfew on the women? Why not a curfew on the men? They're the ones that are committing the rape. Mm. You know, mm. and, it's, and it's even with uh, a lot of prostitutes are definitely not in it voluntarily. A lot of them are, but a lot aren't. And when you go to the police department for support, it's they're, they're, the whole attitude is like, yeah, sure, okay, mm-hmm. There are a lot of people who are watching right now who cannot comprehend the statement that you will now address. It could happen to anybody. That's right. Talk about that, and as you think that over, let me invite the folks to jump on the telephone. 313 in Detroit, 872-4040 is our telephone number. Our guest is Linda Marciano. Some of you may know her as Linda Lovelace. Some of you may know the film, and uh, you may be seeing a different side of Linda tonight. All of the people who went around and said she wants to be there, nobody's forcing her. See how she's smiling. She seems to be enjoying it. Maybe you get a different picture right now. It could happen to anyone. How do you mean that? Well, exactly that. I mean, as a child growing up, my whole attitude was like, oh, rape. That's impossible. Nobody could ever rape another human being. And then it happened to me. And uh, I realized it could happen to anyone, especially a child that's very protective, which I was. Uh, I can understand my parents' attitude wanting to give me the good things in life, protecting me from the evils. And having my own children now, I feel that same compulsion. You know, these are my children. If, don't ever hurt them. And you, want, you don't really want to let them know about the evils in society. But that's very wrong. As parents and adults, we should tell our children everything. Not just the good things in life, but also the bad. You got angry because you uh, said that your father saw the film and he didn't come to try to help you, huh? I got very upset. I had a very difficult time seeing that film to, with George C. Scott, where he did everything he possibly could to, to find his daughter. And I was upset by that. I, I broke down emotionally. And uh, it was like, why didn't he do that for me? Were you forced to learn the techniques that you used in Deep Throat? Were you forced to do that? Uh, I was put under hypnosis to learn that technique and eventually I realized that I was better off doing that rather than have, having intercourse with a variety of people. This, I felt, protected me in a way. When you think of the success of that film, it was made for, as I recall, $40,000 mm -hmm. and it made $600 million and it's still shown around nowadays. What do you think that uh, film says about America? Very, very sad. I think it paints a very sad picture. I think that's the greatest disappointment to me is in my society, in my country, the fact that that film is still being shown. Uh, virtually every time someone watches that film, they're watching me being raped. And again, like you said, what are we telling our children? That it's okay? You can, you can commit rape, you can hurt people, and, and it's okay? Nobody knows, though, when they look at you about uh, the situations that I was reading about of uh, a garden hose being put in your rectum, you know, mm -hmm. as a punishment. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what it was? Well, that's, that was his sexual abuse that he used when uh, I, when either if I attempted an escape or if uh, I wasn't being, you know, overwhelmingly happy with the situations that were occurring in Hollywood there. The uh, whole idea of uh, escape, you know, which you've mentioned, uh, a lot of people say, well, why didn't she try to escape sooner? And there were... <laughs> several attempts that you made yeah. and then uh, different people one time a fellow prostitute gave you away and mm -hmm. one time your family it was it your mother who gave you away yeah mr train had a uh, mr train was here right now he would convince you that this guy was not blue but rather black he had a, a, a great way of of speaking and he convinced my mother that he was you know never do something like that again. But I don't think my mother really comprehended what I was saying to her. I said to her we were having sexual problems. And I think in my mother's wildest imagination, she just assumed that, you know, he wanted to go to bed every night and I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I think that was the, the biggest thing that she could think of. 
And uh, like you said, I did make three spontaneous attempts at escaping, which were unsuccessful. You know the deep throat thing, I want to go back. We had a guy in the show recently who talked about the uh, organized crime's involvement in pornography. Mm -hmm. Was organized crime involved in deep throat? Do you know? I really don't know. I've heard that Lou Perino has been arrested and put in prison, who was the producer of the film, but actual organized crime, I can't really answer that because to me, any group of people that group together to commit a crime against another person is organized crime. Mm. To me, Mr. Trainer is organized crime in my definition. What about all the lawsuits? Has anything worked out on your behalf? Uh, so we had some uh, boxes so that the cassettes come in and your mm -hmm. name is all over them now as if you're like actively involved in this. Is yeah. there anything you can do about that? Or? No, unfortunately the legal system in our country is more protective of the criminals than they are the victims. That's why this ordinance in Minneapolis is so very important. Tell us because, what's going on there. Well, the uh, city council was presented with an ordinance and it was accepted that Mayor Fraser uh, vetoed it. And uh, it's going back to the new city council, which came, uh, they have a new group that came in in January, and it's going to be re, you know, given back to them. But um, this will give, for the first time, the opportunity of a victim that has been coerced or uh, beaten into performing in a pornographic film the right to sue the person that did it. And also, it's going to be the first time where a producer will be able you, you will be able to go after the producers, the people who make the money on the coercion of another human being. When you uh, back something like this and go and testify mm -hmm. uh, pornography legislation in a city like Minneapolis, or you uh, give a talk someplace and people uh, have a chance to get to know you and respond to you, do they begin to see it in a different light? I think so. I think over the years, I think the most important thing is the fact that I did mention so many people's names in Hollywood that abused me. And the fact that these very wealthy people have not produced any lawsuits or done anything, you know, uh, about it. Then the common person realizes that I must be telling the truth. And I did go through two days, three days of a lie detector test before the book came out. And uh, I think it's just... I guess it's just my honesty and my presence that people realize I am telling the truth. I did a program in Boston uh, with a psychiatrist and uh, the interview was very hesitant to believe what I was saying and they turned to the psychiatrist and said, how much of Linda's story is really true? And he said, the only difference between Linda's story and what's really going on in our society today is the fact that she's alive to talk about it. He says, most of the girls are used and abused by the pimps and pornographers, injected with heroin, so they have the marks on the arms and the, the drug in their body and, when, and tossed in an alleyway. And when the police find them, they just assume that it's a prostitute or a junkie who's OD'd. Linda Marciano is our guest. We're talking about pornography. We're talking about prostitution. She's uh, been uh, taking a lot of her life lately to get her self-respect back. I think she's doing a terrific job. Thank Your you. phone call's coming up next on Late Night America. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Okay, my name is Frank. I'm calling from Detroit. I have uh, uh, really two questions for Linda. Number one, I understand that uh, the man that uh, did all this to Linda, uh, Chuck Trainer, uh, later on became the manager for Marilyn Chambers. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any uh, is there any word or evidence that he's done the same kind of things to her? Uh, the only thing we really know at this point is Larry Fields did an interview with Miss Chambers and Mr. Trainer, and during the course of the interview, she was about to go on stage, she asked permission to go to the bathroom, and Mr. Trainer refused. And Larry Fields interjected and said, why don't you let the girl go to the bathroom? She's about to go on stage. And Mr. Trainer's comment was, uh, I don't tell you how to write your newspaper, don't tell me how to treat my broads. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm very happily married, and I don't have to ask permission to go to the bathroom.
Do you have a quick second question? Yes, my second question is this. Uh, in view of that, uh, apparently he treats all his women like that. Uh, why wasn't it possible to get a hold of uh, somebody else who's willing to uh, testify, so to speak, the same way as Linda, and press charges against this, uh, this animal? Well, unfor there is a girl that I've been in touch with that uh, escaped from Mr. Trainer prior to his acquiring me. And uh, she still, to this day, is terrified of him hurting her or her family. And uh, as far as what can be done to him, the court system in our society has to realize there is only a, a two-year, let me go back here, a two-year statute of limitations to what you can do for uh, body damages. Whereas if there's physical, I mean, property damages, the uh, judgment, uh, I mean, the statute can go up to almost 15 years. But in this situation, it's only two. And what the court system in our society has to realize is that when a woman is held prisoner, like myself, two and a half years, you're not free the next day. And, you know, everything is the way it used to be before it all occurred. And I think this is a very important thing. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Uh, yes, my name is Todd Anthony from Tampa, Florida. And I was wondering, um, Linda, you claim that you were more or less forced into deep throat. Were you paid for your part in the movie? Uh, Mr. Trainer received $1,250 for my services. I was not permitted to have money because with money I could escape. Thank you. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hi, this is Lori from Seattle. First of all, Linda, I wanted to say I read your book and it was heartbreaking. <laughs> and I know that it's possible that this can happen to women because it happened to my mother. She was in an abusive relationship with a man for four years, and it wasn't easy for her to get out of. So I, I just know that it, it can happen to anyone, a, a so-called innocent woman from a, a middle-class background or whatever. But my question was, I saw you on Woman to Woman a while back. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, and uh, there, they had several women on there who were involved in the pornography industry. Mm -hmm. And one of them said that pornography has more opportunities for women than any other oh. there is. <laughs> yes, I remember that lady. <laughs> Writers and producers and directors and, and women in positions of decision-making and power. And I find that really hard to believe. <laughs> and yeah. Whenever you see anything to do with pornography, it's obviously aimed towards men. And I'm wondering if you ever did come into contact with any women who were in power in the industry. Thank you. Other than that program, the producer and, uh, and the theater owner, I never really have. Thank you. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Ah, uh, yes. My name's Dawn from Largo, Florida. Hi there. And I'd like to ask her, um, how old are her children and what is she going to tell them if they're not old enough to understand when they do get old enough, what is she going to tell them? Uh, well, I have a son, da Dominic, who's seven, and my daughter, Lindsay, is three, and my stepson, Larry Paul, is 12. He is very aware of what happened to me because he's the one that Mr. Trainer put a gun to um, when he was a baby. And uh, my son Dominic, when Ordeal first came out, I simply told him that some people hurt mommy very badly a few years ago and mommy's written a book about it. And uh, as far as my daughter, she's still too young to really understand. And I think what's most important with my children is the, the love that I give them and the self-esteem that I allow them to develop within themselves is going to make them realize that, you know, I'm your mom and I was abused. And then I think that's really what's most important. I think the hardest thing for me with my children was going on tour with Ordeal, was telling, uh, you know, and hearing all about child pornography where the youngest victim's 13 months old. I had to find a way to express to him what was going on. And I was having a very difficult time. And uh, we, were, we were coloring in the living room one day, and a news program came on with uh, a girl speaking about how this man was molesting children in the woods between, the, there was like a development and the school area and a group of woods in between. And I turned to my son, Dominic, who was five at the time. I said, Dominic, do you understand what this lady's saying? this girl saying, he goes, yes, mommy. He says, sometimes people get you very close and when they do, they hurt you. I said, that's right, Dominic. And if anybody ever grabs you, I want you to scream as loud as you can and punch and kick. And when you get on that ground, you run right home or to your, my closest neighbor. And he gave this blood curdling scream. And he says, how's that, mom? You know, I said, that's perfect, Dominic. And they ran around the coffee table, down the hall and back again. He says, I'm the fastest. And it was like, I found a way to like give him a little piece of what's going on in our society but then I cry because our childhood is the most precious time of our lives 
why, what are we doing in our society that we have to warn a five-year-old about child molestation and rape and, and everything else? It saddens me. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Yes, I'm Phil from Houston, and uh, I'd like to ask Linda what she thinks when a Supreme Court legalizes abortion, allows prostitution to remain criminal so that women can be white slaved by the perverts. Well, I think our legal system in our society has to take a change of course here. Again, like I mentioned before, the victim is always the one that suffers the most, and the criminal is always the one that gets away with everything. I think the, uh, maybe some folks, uh, you know, they, they hear about it like a, a, a battered wives, you know, mm -hmm. or abused children and things like that. And everybody's always very quick to say, well, they could walk out the door. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but there's a whole lot of dynamics. There have been a couple of major stories in the magazines within the last year of, of people who lived in this oppressive situation. One, one was a, a murder that ended up someplace where one of the kids finally just blew away the uh, right. the parent who had been, uh, I guess the father, yeah. who had been guilty of all this abuse toward the kids and the mother for such a long time. And, and everybody's very quick to sit back and say, well, they can walk out the door. Yeah. It's not as simple as no, that, is it? No, it's not. And I, I, in a way, I, I, I think those people are very special in a, cer in, a, in a certain respect because they've never known fear obviously. If you've ever known any kind of fear or ever been in, in the smallest situation like that, you would be more understanding of it. Mm -hmm. you know? Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, my name's Raymond. I'm calling from Nashville. Go ahead, Ray. Um, I was wondering, uh, I haven't read the book Ordeal, but I read the article that uh, Gloria Steinem wrote in her book, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellion. How has that uh, affected your case? Has that given you more credibility and uh, uh, Gloria Steinem has always been very supportive of me. I met her over four years ago, and she's been a very good friend. And uh, I think, of course, it has helped. I mean, had Linda Borman come out, you know, and said, this is what happened to me, uh, I was not a willing participant, I was a victim, people would have just said, oh, yeah, sure. But having, you know, people with credibility behind me and supporting me definitely has made a difference. Thank you. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Yes, I'm Kathy from Detroit. I wanted to know how long it took Linda to develop a relationship with somebody after this all happened. It's a very interesting question. Yeah, it, um, well, I have a very wonderful husband who's very supportive of me. We're like a, a scale. We balance each other. When he's down, I'm up, and we help each other through the situation. And uh, had I not been able to have a relationship with, a, with my husband and have the children that I always wanted, Mr. Trainer would have been the winner, and I didn't want that to happen. And I think my belief in God, uh, my love for God, and uh, gave me a, a great deal of strength. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My name is Joe, and I would like to know, other than what you have on a program now and your book and everything, what other income do you have? Oh, my husband is a spackler. <laughs> What's a spackler? That's my Joe? income. What's a spackler? And, uh, oh, you know, if they, they put the um, white stuff, the spackle on the sheetrock, oh, he's probably going to kill me here. I don't, you know, they just smooth out all the edges and everything okay. before for before painting. And um, as far as the book, I don't receive income from the book anymore. Uh, unfortunately, one of the lawyers who uh, abused me uh, is uh, taking all the royalties from the book because I didn't appear in a cabaret act in Florida because my life was threatened. So you had uh, a commitment to go to do something? Right. You backed out of that? Well, I had escaped from Mr. Trainer, and uh, I ended up not doing the cabaret act because of Oh, so many reasons. My life was threatened. The lives of all the people involved in it were threatened. When I got uh, protective orders to protect the people, they all wanted to become involved again. Who, who set up this booking? Uh, Mr. Trainer, Mr. Mandina, who was his lawyer, Mr. Davis. Oh, so Davis. it was supposed to be a pornographic club act? Uh, they said at the time it wasn't going to be. I mean, they said that to the public. But behind the scenes, they were saying how they were going to have nude scenes and, and things like that. It was supposedly a showcase for Las Vegas, but... So you backed yeah. out of that, and well, who sued I, you? Well, my life was threatened if who I sued, appeared. Okay, who sued you? Uh, the corporation sued. They, they took so much money, and then uh, the lawyer, 
Mr. Trainor's lawyer is presently suing. Uh, he was awarded a judge in a def on, on reasons of default because I didn't appear in Florida and uh, because he guaranteed my appearance. So he was awarded a judgment 12 years ago for something like, uh, I think it was $12,000. But now, over the years, with the penalties and interest, it's, they want $42,000, so. You don't have $42,000? No. <laughs> Hi there. Like everybody in America, we make it week to week. <laughs> Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee, my name is Bill. Hi, Bill. My question concerns this uh, Minneapolis statute about pornography. I've heard from the ACLU that this statute is not gender neutral, that it only applies to that pornography that degrades women and not that which uh, degrades men. And if that charge is true, I'm disturbed by it. I would hope that this law is gender neutral. It is. It is definitely. It's not just for women. It is for men, young boys, and children. Definitely. Hi there. You're on Late Night America. Uh, yes, sir. This is David from Appleton, Wisconsin. Hi, David. And I would like to ask uh, Linda Lovelace if it is not true that even before she met this Mr. Trainer, that she had made movies where this technique that she developed, she displayed, and uh, that she had been doing this even before this time. No, that's not true. Now, my introduction to the pornographic industry was with Mr. Trainer. Before that, uh, I was a very innocent, middle-class child that was going to become a nun, you know. Where did you come by that information? Just rumor? No, I think I read that someplace, and I didn't know if that was true or not. They had said something like that she had performed with... Um, you know, animals or something, and you know, I, I just wasn't sure if that was true. That's why I'm asking this. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever perform with an animal? Uh, I, at gunpoint, with through Mr. Trainer. What'd you do? What I'd rather mean? not talk about no, it. No, I mean, that's so much that. I mean, there was yeah. a film after Deep Throat? No. Or before it Deep was before. My total involvement in the pornographic industry was two weeks prior to the filming of Deep Throat. And how many films they actually made out of it, I really have no idea. And it was through that that Mr. Trainer got in touch with, or Mr. Damiano got in touch with Mr. Trainer, and then Deep Throat was made. So there was some other filming. Oh yeah, two weeks. Well, that was, I was. He said before Mr. Trainer. Yeah, but no, no this but, was with Mr. Trainer. Yeah, but this was in the month of December, and then Deep Throat was made in January. Were there any films after Deep Throat? No. Well, there was in. Uh, what were they? What they call it? Deep Throat Part Two, but that was with Mr. Trainer. And once I escaped from Mr. Trainer, there was Linda Lovelace for president. Was and that, a, that was it. Was that a porno film? No, no, not at all. And with my husband, my present husband, Larry, they tried to get us. We had received a, a script, which was about the size of a TV guide. It was a beautiful love story, right? And we ended up in Italy. And by the time we got there, it was the size of a telephone book. And it was so pornographic, it was pathetic. And I got fired from the set for not appearing in the nude. Huh. Yeah. You've been asked to do pornography again. Oh, yes. I've been offered uh, two and a half million dollars in a Swiss bank account for my husband and I just to make love together. Hi there. You're on Late Night America. Hello? Yes. You're on the air? Okay, yes. Uh, I have a question for the lady. Go ahead. Uh, I don't believe what she's... Uh, saying about the fact that she could never get away from her pimp because if she wanted to get away there's nobody that's any more forceful than police or FBI. I can't buy her story. Oh, you see, you can't really say that because when I did escape from Mr. Trainer, I first of all, Mr. Trainer never permitted me out of his sight and it wasn't just his verbal and physical abuse. He had a Walther PPK 45 automatic eight shot he had an M16 semi-automatic machine gun and knives. He threatened my life, the lives of my family, and the lives of my friends. Uh, you reach a point, and I envy you for never knowing fear, because obviously you've never been in a situation like this. And that I'm you know, grateful for you for that. Uh, but when you're in a situation where you are like I was, it's uh, you know, fear. You're encompassed with fear. You're dehumanized. You're not your own human being anymore. When you've been submitted to the things that I was submitted to, I became a robot um, that mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. what she had to do in order to survive and be alive today. And as far as the police goes, I called the Beverly Hills Police Department and I said, my husband's running around town with a 45 and an M16. Their attitude was like, lady, we don't get involved in domestic affairs. I said, fine, I can deal with that. But he's illegally possessing these weapons. They said, lady, call us back when he's in the room. 
So that's as much as you can say about the police department. And it's not truly the police department's fault. The laws are not written to give police the power to help a victim. Some people might not uh, say, and uh, to this caller, and I, I imagine a number of people may still think this way, no, no matter sure. what they hear, is they probably say, why don't people stop paying protection money? You know, when people have to pay off uh, $100 a week or $1,000 a month so that the, uh, sure. the, the, so, so that the place doesn't get burned down. Mm -hmm. But people pay it because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. You stayed in that situation because you're afraid. I sure. take it, right? Sure. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, uh, my name's Bill from Atlanta. Go ahead, Bill. First of all, uh, I was involved in the, uh, the industry for about 10 years up until last year I got out of it. My question for Linda, I guess, is that uh, this her film was made over 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, the book came out, I believe, a year or two years ago. I've, I've seen her a couple of times now on TV. Four. Uh, in the Minneapolis situation, it, it's so removed from her experience. I'm wondering, uh, and there's so many other aspects to the uh, the ordinance that was that was uh, going to be passed there. Why did she get involved in that, or why did she uh, key in on that? Okay, would you stay on the line, Bill? Because after Linda answers, I want to ask you a question. Um, as far as my involvement with the ordinance, this ordinance gives me the opportunity to do something to Mr. Trainer and the producers of the film. And uh, it's not just me, it'll help other victims of the pornographic industry who have been forced into performing in a pornographic film. Is it, is it directly targeted toward them or toward all of the industry? It is the first time the producers are going to be liable for what's going on. When in the past, it's always been, I've been in courts in Arizona and uh, Oh, a few other places in Kentucky, and it's always the the girl that sold the popcorn is being convicted because the film Deep Throat was being shown. Yeah. Uh, it was the guy who opened the door to the theater who was being convicted. I, he was being put up on 10 to 15 years. This will give the opportunity to go to the people who are making the money and abusing people. Uh, Bill, can I ask you this question? Sure. Uh, you've been around the industry for 10 years. You've heard uh, Linda uh, tonight. Uh, our the women who are involved in this, uh, in pornography, uh, treated in the manner uh, uh, that, that, of, uh, that Linda speaks of. That was, my next, that was my next question to her. It's been so long since she's been in it, and I know she's exposed to it, and I appreciate what she's going through, and I, I admire her for it, and I think Trainer's a jerk anyway. I know most of the, uh, most of the people in the business, and I can, I can truthfully say that uh, Today and in the last five or six years, uh, the people who are employed in these movies are professionals. Uh, they don't get the same type of uh, treatment that Linda got. They do this because they get paid very, very well for it, and I know because I paid them. Uh, no one abuses them, no one beats them, no one shoots them. And there's one other point I want to make here. If well, I, wait, let's get I, I have to response. interject here because how do you know that they weren't there in a forced situation? It's like had Lin if Mr. Trainer brought Linda Lovelace to you, you know, when you were involved in this, how would you have known that I was an unwilling participant? I didn't get just get off the turnip truck yesterday. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. You didn't answer the question, though. Uh, you, you, the chances are you might not know. That's the question. Yeah. I mean, you just don't know. Uh, but we thank you for your input into the conversation. Um, we're going to try real quick. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Real quick. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Kurt from uh, Nova Scotia, and uh, from what I've heard tonight, Linda, you're uh, obviously a woman who possesses a great deal of courage and uh, very commendable morality. I'd like to know how you manage to summon up the great deal of courage it must take for you to do what you're doing. Thank you. I got a great deal of my coverage from my God and from my husband. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you got some munchkins running around? Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> okay. Good for you. Uh, Linda Lovelace is... Uh, paperback, uh, it's out in paperback now, called Ordeal, uh, what we've talked about and a whole lot more. We thank you for being with us tonight and giving us an education. Well, I want to thank you very much for having me on the program and giving me the opportunity to speak out and maybe he help another human being. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say a quick thank to Marge and Sal for taking care of my children because without them tonight, we couldn't have been here. Okay. It says Linda Lovelace on the title. It is Linda Marciano. Okay, good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. We take a break, friends. When we come back on the other side, we're going to talk with James Coco. I'm going to talk about weight and keeping it off. And uh, I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. Friday, 
on the best of late night America, Irish Republican Army supporter Michael Flannery and Dr. Robert Mendelson reveals why he doesn't like most pediatricians. On Monday, a foreign policy expert tells why he thinks Russia is strategically outsmarting us. And a sports psychiatrist explains what it is that motivates us to compete. Then on Tuesday, shocking new information about chemical warfare in Afghanistan and how to train your mind to remember almost anything.